It's always a joy to come up here for Nancy and I for a couple of reasons. Number one, she mentioned already, it's because we have so many friends and fellow believers here. We feel like our hearts beat together with you. And the second reason is I was raised very similar to many of you. Old German Baptist brethren, uh, Anabaptist, similar to Amish or Mennonite. I need your help this morning. What is an emblem? Any idea? Yeah, a sign, a symbol. Can you, can you think of any emblems? The peace sign, yeah, yeah. Right out of the 1960s, I believe. What else? What is it? A flag, yes, yes. Yeah, a symbol of a country. Exactly. Mm hmm. An emblem. There's another emblem that I'm thinking of this morning, and it's one that calls forth the deepest emotions in us, and it's standing behind me here. Yes, remember that song? The emblem of suffering and shame. And we look at that in our mind's eye, and we see a piece of wood, and maybe don't think much about it. But the whole hinge point of history was focused on that piece of wood and what happened there impact the entire universe for eternity. And so we see the cross in our culture at times. We see it trivialized <clears throat> by people praying to it or hanging it around their neck like a talisman of some sort. But to quote Malcolm Muggeridge from England, the cross is the ultimate focus of longing and fulfillment. But it's a different cross that I ask you to consider this morning. In fact, I ask you to walk with me. You all like to walk, right? Let's go on a journey in our minds through a minefield of life, and we want to look at a few false crosses and eventually come back to the real one. We need to get through this minefield so we can see what's beyond, what's over on the other side of it. And if we get safely through this minefield, we will find our life and we will smile. We will smile. Are you ready? <clears throat> I'm not sure if it was Blaise Pascal or Fulton Ausler. One of them made a statement a number of years ago. Both of them were what they call polymath. A polymath is an individual that can do a lot of things well. And the statement is this. Most people, or many people, crucify themselves between two crosses. The cross of fear and the cross of regret. Wow. <clears throat> That's not bad for the 1800s, right? The cross of regret. You see, a lot of people spend their lives crucified between those two crosses. And there's the cross of regret. What if I do it? Why did I say that? Why did I fail? Or why didn't I say that? Ah, I should have said something. I had an opportunity and I missed it. Oh, God. Can you bring that opportunity back? Have you ever had that experience, any of you? Absolutely. I know I have. I look back on my life and I say, ah, there was that one time. No, there wasn't one time. There was a dozen times. I should have said something, and I missed it. Why didn't I speak up at that right time? And the Spirit of God comes in later and says, yeah, maybe there will be another time. And there usually is, if you ask God for it. The cross of regret. And so the title of today's message is, I was going to do that, but, but I was going to do that. I was going to do that. I chose that title because I think it encapsulates the cry of humanity. One of the greatest cries is the cry of regret. Good intentions never accomplished. The sin of omission. I was going to do that. 
He sat in my office. He sat in my office some uh, 15 years ago. Uh, an individual, <clears throat> him and his wife, and he made a statement of profound regret to me. He said, my father said to me when he was 62 years old, and I'm 60, so that's getting close home. My father said, my entire life has been a failure. And he said this to his son. Now, that's a terrible thing to say to your son, by the way. That's a devastating statement. And he looked back at this train wreck of decisions that he wished he would have done differently in his life. And he told his son, my whole life has been a failure. And the man sharing this with me. <clears throat> and then he said this, and then the regret got very close home, and he said, I have become just like my father. I've become just like my father. In other words, I'm a failure too. I can't do anything right. My whole life has been a failure. Think about that. Think about that. This morning I'm calling for a revival of thought in your minds, dear ones. And the thought is that God is able. God is able. No one has to be crucified on one of those two crosses or even between them. <clears throat> no matter what the problem is that you've carried around or brushed up against this week, I believe God has the answer. He can handle it. He can handle it. I'm here to tell you. And it's been my experience in life to discover, this is interesting, by the way, that people regret more the things they didn't do than the things they did do. Did you know that? Yeah. People regret more the things that they didn't do or failed to do. Oh, if I would have invested in Chrysler in 1982 <laughs> or, or Amazon in 1991. <clears throat> oh, the regrets. Why did I do that? But I was going to do that. But I was going to, you can do it, my friend. You can do it if two things are present. Number one, if it's the will of God. And number two, if it is within the abilities that God has given you, you can do it, my friend. And we should do it if it's the right thing to do. This fellow in my office chose to clean up some regrets in his life. And I, how do you do that? You just take him to Jesus and step back and pray for him. He hadn't been to church in years, his bitterness had become a huge barrier in his life. Wherever he went, it was this concrete wall around him. You couldn't get close to people because of the wall. He cleaned up his bitterness and some of his regrets. He took it to Jesus Christ, and the Spirit of God touched the heart of that man. They went home, and I forgot about them until two months later. Got an email from the wife. Guess who went to church today? I had an idea. And not only that, she said he went around and hugged every person in there. And the people in the church are saying, something's happened in that guy's life. Amen. What happened? The Spirit of God came in and touched his heart. Gave him peace where there was regret, joy where there was pain, and gratitude where there was bitterness. By the way, gratitude is one of the greatest human expressions, friends. If you don't have it in your life, you're in trouble. <clears throat> Same with me. If you don't have gratitude in your life, you're not going to go to heaven. Did you know that? What? Mr. Wagoner, yeah, it's in the Bible. Enter into his gates with? Exactly. Thanksgiving. <clears throat> I was going to do that, but <clears throat> regret is expressed well in Jean-Paul Sartre, a um, French philosopher's statement. In a way, he said, hell is other people. <whistles> Whoa, huh? <laughs> hell is other people. Can you feel, can you hear some pain in that statement? In other words, I was doing all right until you came along. Uh-uh. Uh uh. If you have the potential to bring a little bit of hell into someone's life, friends, and you also have the ability to bring a little bit of heaven into the lives of others. The solution was easy for God. You see, this fellow went home <clears throat> and he affected a lot of other people, the one that I was describing. 
And I hope you're getting the picture this morning that our choices affect our decisions and our decisions affect our destiny. Regret. Regret will crucify your freedom in life. You see, you have to let go of the past in order to move forward, you know. You look back and you see this train load of yesterdays behind you. And they follow you wherever you go. You say, Lord, I can't move very fast with that train load behind me. And he says, I know. So I come to set you free. What's more important than the past is the future. Our second illustration of regret shows up in an unexpected unexpected place in the throne room of King Herod Agrippa II. Remember him? Ah, he's in the Bible. And standing in front of him this day is our brother Paul of Tarsus, the man who used to be Saul. And he stands there and he makes a statement to Felix and Festus and King Herod Agrippa II. And he expresses the one regret in his life. And that is, I persecuted the people of God before I knew better. That bothered Paul. Well, how do we know? Because he mentioned it several times in the Bible. That weighed heavily on his heart. And he said, I was the chief of sinners. I persecuted God's people. But something happened in the heart and the life of Paul as he came down toward the end of his life. The regret wasn't there anymore. And he said, there is laid up for me a crown of life which the Lord himself shall give to me on which day? That day, exactly. Go through the Bible sometime with a pencil and a piece of paper and write down all the times you see that day in there. You'll see a fascinating trend. That day, that day, that day, that day. And they all look forward to the great consummation of Jesus Christ. Paul said, there is laid up for me a crown of life. Paul eloquently gives his story to the ruler. And in the heart of that testimony is that one lingering regret, I persecuted these people. How could I have done that? And then, ironically enough, we find in the little conversation in that throne room that day, the, the foundation of one of the worst, un, worst regrets in the entire Bible. And it comes from the lips of King Herod Agrippa II himself, who said, almost... Almost. Boy, there's going to be some regret for that one someday, huh? Unless he became a believer. I don't know. <clears throat> Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. I was going to do that, but... By the way, you look back on things that happened to you, and some of them are... Some of them can be painful. They can be traumatic. We care about that. Well... What are you going to do with it? You're going to carry it around with you? You're going to let it go? Put it at the feet of the cross. Just leave it there. Say, Jesus, can you take care of that? Absolutely, he can. And if you lack the courage to put it there, come to our house and put it in the dumpster. <clears throat> we have a big dumpster out back. You can just, you can just throw it in there. Leave it. <clears throat> You'll be sad when you think about things that hurt you in the past, maybe but they don't have to hurt anymore. That's the difference. They don't have to hurt anymore. Sad is all right. Sad but no pain is freedom. It's the kind of freedom that God offers you and I. I was going to do that. I recently heard the story of a woman who spent 12 years in prison because of unlawful drugs. She found Christ. And today she's a free woman who helps others. Well, how did she get there? She had to let go of a lot of regrets, friends, because regrets will keep you from moving forward. Second Corinthians 7, verse 10, says, Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no, what's the word? Exactly, regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. I mentioned there were two crosses, remember? Regr regret and... Starts with an F, ends with an R. Yeah, fear and regret. I grew up under the shadow of a man whose greatest fear <clears throat> was that he wouldn't live long enough to help all the people that he wanted to help in life. 
That's a pretty good fear, isn't it? Yeah. And it reminds me of the words of John Wesley. Give me just 12 men, he said, who love Christ and fear only God, and I will change England. But it's a different kind of fear before us this morning. A couple of years ago, a fellow worker <clears throat> quoted Revelation chapter 21, verse 8 to me. And oddly enough, he was the second or third person that week to bring up that verse. I said, God wants me to take a look at this one. So I got in there and opened it up. He was he was earnest. The other person who asked was a woman named Sarah. And it says there, among other things, somebody have that verse, Revelation 21, verse 8? <clears throat> somebody with a good, strong voice. Exactly. What do you need to get into heaven? Psalm 100, gratitude. Oh, the blood of Jesus Christ, of course, but gratefulness for what he's done for you. What can keep you out of heaven? Right, number one on the list here? Fear. Outside the kingdom are the fearful. Well, if your life is motivated by fear, then you're in a lot of trouble. <clears throat> Which, by the way, is why Paul said the love of Christ compels me. It motivates me. It moves me from here to there. The love of Christ walks with me. The hand of Jesus Christ is on my shoulder. You see, the law of God was a condemning finger pointing at you, saying all I can give you is death. That's all I can give you. But then you repent, and then something marvelous happens. That finger becomes a hand that rest upon your shoulder. God writes his law upon your heart and it becomes something to will and to do within you. Wonderful story of the new covenant. If your life is motivated by fear, then the gun at your head is a more immediate, serious fear, you think, right, than a looming judgment someday, somewhere down the road. If you're motivated by fear, the gun at your head, you're going to do whatever that, yes, yes, whatever you want, I'll do it, I'll do it. But if you are motivated by the wonderful love of God and the fear of God, which means respect for him, you're not going to yield to the gun. Look at the books of the, the stories of the martyrs <clears throat> down through history who looked death in the face. And they said, you can take my life. It's all I have to give, but I am not going to turn my back on God. I love the story of Polycarp, A.D., 134, I believe. When they brought him out into the arena where they were torturing Christians in the front of everyone, they said, we'll let you go. By the way, he was a disciple of John the Revelator. Knew him personally. Name's Polycarp. And they said, we'll let you go. All you have to do is just pick up a little pinch of this incense, go over here to the altar, and put it on there and burn it, and then swear by the guiding spirit of Caesar. You know, 40,000 people watching him. What are you going to do? He opened his mouth. He used his words to glorify God. <clears throat> and he said, 86 years have I served him. Never yet has he done me any wrong. How then can I blaspheme my king who saved me? The prefect said, I have fire. He says, call for it. Your fire burns but a short while. Now they're really puzzled. They didn't know what to do. So they tied his hands behind him and they put him on the stake. And they lit the fire. And he looked up to heaven and he said, Father, I bless thee for thy goodness for having brought me to this hour. That's the right kind of fear. You fear only God. He didn't fear the fire, friends. So what are you afraid of? Are you afraid of failure? If your life is motivated by fear, you're going to have a lot of regrets in life. I was going to do that, but don't be 
afraid to fail, by the way. I, I, have you failed at anything? Oh, good, you're like me. Yes, I have failed at a number of things. I've succeeded at a few, too, and so have you, by God's grace. <clears throat> the word fail, as you go to the dictionary, means to fall short of success or achievement in something expected, attempted, desired, or approved. Got that from dictionary.com. Using that simple definition, we must admit that we all fail. John says if we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So let's not lie to ourselves this morning. Yeah, we, we've all failed, sure. But are we afraid of failure? We go through life motivated by that inordinate fear. And since everyone fails, we shouldn't be afraid to fail. And we shouldn't be careless either as we go through our our activities in life. Some people don't try at all. And some only half-heartedly try. Why? Because they're afraid they might fail. What if I fail? What if I do it wrong? Then what? They might laugh at me. They might talk about me. Oh, yeah, they might. We know what that feels like. Yeah. I won't try. Therefore, I won't fail. I will succeed by not trying. Right? In the parable of the talents, you remember that story in the Bible. Jesus tells the story. The one man had this attitude, didn't he? He was afraid to try, and so he takes his talent. I don't know what you what you vision when you think of a talent. I kind of think of a bag of something. Maybe it's heavy. He takes that, and he puts it down, digs a hole, puts it in there, smooths it over. Yes. I did good, right? Master comes back and he says, where's your talent? Oh, um, I, I, I still have it. I buried it. Well, he didn't get very high marks, did he? No, he, he was afraid of failure. When his master returned, he was punished as a lazy and wicked slave. You'll find that story, servant, in uh, Matthew 25, verse 18. If we allow ourselves to be paralyzed by fear, we guarantee failure in the form of eternal damnation. That's what Matthew 25 teaches us. But, but, if we rise above fear and obey God, serving him to the best of our ability... By risking failure to gain success, the Lord will, according to his word, mercifully grant us a home in heaven. So failure, friends, doesn't necessarily result in damnation. I forget how many times Thomas Edison failed when he was trying to make a light bulb. It was a bunch, wasn't it? See? <laughs> Thank you. That's a bunch. <laughs> but it worked. Look. It worked eventually, didn't it? Number 88 must have worked. And now we have these lighting up West Salem Mission. Don't be afraid to fail. Keep going is, is the word there, friends. Oh, I was going to do that, but keep going, friends. Keep going. <clears throat> if failure automatically resulted in damnation, we would never be saved. I, there'd be no hope for me be no hope for you. But the opposite is actually true. Since we failed, we need salvation, friends. Exactly. We need a friend. We need Jesus Christ. And we shouldn't be afraid to fail. As failures, we'll either obey God, resulting in eternal life, or we will continue disobeying him, resulting in eternal damnation. Either way. Either way. We'll all make some mistakes and fail at some point in life. So don't be afraid to act. Don't be crucified on the cross of fear. At first, Esther was afraid to fail in the Bible, wasn't she? Mm -hmm. And she had good reason to kind of pause at that suggestion, go into the king unannounced, uninvited. If the king didn't, uh, this is my scepter here. If the king didn't hold out his scepter, she was in a heap of trouble, right? Yeah. She would die. Fear of what others will say. Oh, they'll talk about me. Well, yeah, they might. In fact, they probably will if you stand up for Christ. They don't. <clears throat> if you follow Jesus Christ in the midst of a hostile world, yeah, they'll talk about you, sure. But they may also realize that there's something in you that's desirable. And that's what we want. That's what I want people to see in you. 
You're going to meet a lot of people this coming week, friends. Some of them you don't even know yet. No, it's okay. <clears throat> You'll have an opportunity to speak something to them, to be a blessing to them somehow. You don't know what you're going to say or do. You don't even know who they are. But ask God at the start of the week. Say, God, you, as you bring people into my life this week, help me to be an encouragement to them. Help me to be a pinpoint of light and truth somehow, somehow because of you. Fear of what others will say. When I left the German Baptist Church in 1989, rumors about me went from California to Pennsylvania just like that. And they didn't even have the Internet at that time. You do you hear about Jerry? Oh, terrible. <clears throat> terrible. Gerald Wagoner's son did that. By the way, that is joining the Adventist Church, leaving the German Baptist Church. Didn't matter. Oddly, I didn't care. I'd come to the point where I had been completely broken of all pride. And I said, God, I don't care what you, what you want me to do. I just want to do what your will is. And so I joined the Advent Church, uh, 1989, January the 7th. <clears throat> Let the rumors fly. That's all right. That's okay. Fear of what others will say. I'd like to quote something from the Bible. It says, Hear me, you who know what is right, you people who have my law in your hearts. Do not fear, there's our word, the reproach of men, or be terrified by their insults. For the moth will eat them like a garment. The worm will devour them like wool, but, and there's the but, but my righteousness will last forever. There's good news there, friends. There's something that will last, something that is going to endure forever. And just reach out your hand and say, God, I, I want to be connected to that righteousness. I don't know how. Show me how. And he will. I promise you he will. You get down on your knees, you look up to heaven, you pray a simple prayer and just say, I need you. He hears. Pardon? <clears throat> I don't have it written down. Start in Genesis and go to Revelation. It's in there. <laughs> I'll find it later. Fear of what others will do. You look up to heaven and say, God, I need you. He accepts that. He hears and he accepts. And then something else will come out of your mouth. After a while, you say, God, I trust you. Why? Because you see that he's trustworthy. And then lastly, you'll say like Paul, God, I love you. I love you. And nothing can separate you from the love of God. Nothing. Fear of what others do. Isaiah 8, 12, 14. Say ye not a confederacy to all them to whom this people shall say a confederacy. Interesting word, right? Neither fear ye their fear. Ah, don't make other people's fear yours. We've seen a lot of that in 2020, by the way. I'm so glad I don't have a television in my home. Most of you don't either. And those of you that do, I'm, I praise God if you manage it right. I probably wouldn't. We don't have one. And I'm glad because throughout February and March of last year, 2020, the news reports, I'm told, were nonstop about coronavirus and they were all bad and worse and bad and worse and bad and it was pouring into people's homes and people were so paralyzed by fear they would go to the front door and they would look out expecting death at any moment <laughs> and shut it step back oh thank god we're safe and i don't trivialize the reality of people who have died my friends but don't let fear become the animating motivation of your life. Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself and let him be your fear. That's in the Bible. Ah, Isaiah chapter 8, 12 to 14. And let him be your dread and he shall be for you a sanctuary. You know what that means? That means there's somewhere safe we can go. That's what a sanctuary is. You're safe there. God will be for you a sanctuary. He says, come, come. Have your father and mother forsaken you? Psalm 25. God says, I, the Lord, will take you up. Has the world criticized and ridiculed you? Have they talked about you in unkind and untrue ways? Come into the sanctuary of God. 
Now, having said all that, I was going to do that, but there is a good kind of fear. You know about that one, right? You'll find that in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 3. Good kind of fear. And you also find it in the great <clears throat> hallmark verse of the three angels' messages. Fear God and give glory to him. Fear God and give glory to him. The next cross is the cross of good intentions. You know about that one, right? Yeah, fear, regret, uh, good intentions. I was going to do that. Um, but didn't have time or didn't have the money or I was tired or oh, we've all been there. There's a statement in the spirit of prophecy that I stumbled across some years ago and I was like, I'll quote it for you. It says, many people will be lost while hoping and desiring to be saved. Wow. Many people will be lost while hoping and desiring to be saved. There's something missing there, right? They hope and desire to be saved. And by the way, desire is where it all starts, right? <clears throat> Everyone in the world is looking for God, friends. Did you know that? Everyone in the world is. I, had to, I told that to a customer the other day. And I said, Roger, everyone in the world is looking for God. Most of them don't know. And he goes, huh. You ever have anybody say, huh. I did. He was telling me about his mother that was ill and she was losing her mind and to Alzheimer's. And he said, I've pretty much decided there's no God. He's my age. Roger is. And I said, well, God, everyone, or Roger, everyone in the world is looking for God. Most of them don't know it. Starts out as a desire for something better. <clears throat> Ends up with the desire of ages. Everyone's looking for God. Some people look for God in money, drugs, sex, fame, pleasure, entertainment, whatever it might be. Everyone in the world is looking for God, but most of them don't know it. And they look in the wrong place. And God is constantly at work to take that misplaced search for himself and turn it into a knowledge, a knowledge of himself. There is a God who loves you. There's a God who cares. There's a God who has answers. There is a God who never changes. Governments of our world change all the time. God never, ever changes. And that's refreshing. We need that kind of... Well, many people will be lost while hoping and desiring to be saved. The cross of good intentions. It stopped there, apparently. They hoped and desired, but they just stopped. They didn't come to a knowledge of God. And they didn't come to a knowledge of salvation and Jesus Christ. So it's not enough to just say, I was going to do that. But can you finish this quote for me made by John Ray in 1670? That goes back a few years, right? The road to hell. <laughs> exactly, exactly. That was in 1670, by the way. It has since been repeated a number of times by you and I today and many other people. And so our first premise under that cross of good intentions is that good intentions are not always good. Our choices, you see, determine the outcome. What choices are you making? Your choices will decide whether or not you hang crucified on the cross of fear or regret or the cross of good intentions or whether you walk in freedom and peace. In Luke chapter 14, verse 28 through 30, Jesus himself emphasizes careful decision-making. And he uses the lesson of, of construction, so we can relate to that, right, guys? <clears throat> Talked about a tower. He said, how many of you guys are going to build a tower and you don't sit down first and start, say, what's this going to cost, right? Yeah. Any of you ever remodel your own house or build one? Yeah, you probably went over a budget a little bit, right? Maybe a lot. Well, ours did. But you sit out first, sit down and write out the budget, and you have a plan. 
Yeah, it might go over some. <clears throat> Jesus tells a story about a tower. And then he sums it up by saying, for which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost to see if you have enough to finish it, lest you end up with just a foundation, no tower. It's the words of Christ. And he says, others will mock you, saying this man started to build and was not able to finish choices, friend. I was going to do that, but choices. We may have good intentions. We may have the best of intentions, friends. Jesus teaches us to count the cost in order to accomplish our intentions. And I'm sure you can relate to that lesson. You've probably seen good intentions spoiled by poor decisions in life, right? Oh, yeah. Like me, 1997, buying an Atlas Copco air compressor in Pennsylvania, diesel air compressor. There was a power company out there that was selling a couple Atlas Copco 185 diesel compressors, and so I took a trailer and went out there and looked at them and said, yeah, I'll I'll take two of them, load them on the trailer. They did. Drove home all the while thinking, oh, that was a good deal. I got me a couple diesel air compressors. I did. Got home and unloaded them. Found out the first one needed a little, oh, they all needed a little bit of work. The one was just for parts, but the one that was actually running, I, I got the thing running and needed a new, um, had needed an axle under it. It was just sitting on this flat plate on the bottom. It was the kind of compressor that's supposed to have an axle when you tow it down the road. So I went and bought a, um, all the components for that, and I lifted it up in my shop with a big hoist and was welding the uh, leaf spring mounts on the bottom and the shackles and everything, and and um, saw something dripping through my welding helmet. Uh-oh. It's diesel fuel. It's on fire. That's not good. Got the fire out. But I'd burned a hole in the gas tank, the diesel tank. Uh, well, okay. Uh, take it out and finish my welding, get another one. And I did. What I didn't know at the time was that they sell about two of those a year, those diesel gas tanks, maybe three. And they're made by some one in Belgium. You can see the price going up, right? <laughs> yeah, it was $700. Almost 800 for that tank. So I bought one, put it in. At least I had a compressor now, though, right? Yes. I hooked that thing up to the truck, and I went down the road, and everything was looking great. <clears throat> Got to the job site, started it up, sounded great for a while. And then it went, <laughs> and stopped. Hmm. Between the diesel engine and the actual compressor pump, there's this big rubber, um, like a flywheel. I forget what they call it in Belgium, but uh, it transfers. It's a power transfer. What would you call it, Alan? Yeah, it was a big old, big old dude, and it came apart. Pieces went everywhere. So, okay, I had to buy one of those. And by the way, they only sell three of those a year, and it's... Belgium, you know, that price went up, so I got one of them, put it in, and I, now I had a compressor, and I was using that thing in 2002 on a Weaver, the incredible edible egg plant, <coughs> Weaver eggs. Uh, uh, yep. <coughs> and it caught on fire. That's not good. I'm up there working on the roof. And smell smoke. Ooh. That compressor was the worst thing I've ever bought. <laughs> Every corner I went around, it was costing me another five hundred thousand to a thousand dollars. So finally, I put the thing in the junk pile. I got maybe sixty dollars out of it, and I went and bought a new one, which worked. <clears throat> I learned a lesson there. I had the best of intentions, right? But I was going to do that. I finally bought a new one. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Ah, now we get to the punchline. Many will say to me on that day, remember, which day? That day. 
Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then Jesus will say, we're not even acquainted. I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Are you seeing any lawlessness in our world, friend? Yeah. Are you seeing any in your own heart? Yeah. The potential for lawlessness in your heart and mine is tremendous. But by the grace of God and the empowering blood of Jesus Christ, we can be more than conquerors through him. And so we've passed through that minefield this morning, friends. We've seen the cross of regret, the cross of fear, and the cross of good intentions. We're all looking for something. We're looking for a better land. Mm -hmm. We're looking for a land where the beauty of the sunset exemplifies the splendor and the power of God. And we have one last cross that we come to, and that's the cross of Calvary. <clears throat> cross of Calvary. That cross sets us free from the other false crosses, friends. Galatians 2.20 says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ who liveth in me. In the life which I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. There's freedom there, friends. There's freedom from fear. There's freedom from regret. You say, well, I've done some things wrong. Yeah, you have. So have I. You've done some things right, too. I'm here to tell you. I had a girl one time say, Mr. Wagoner, my parents did everything wrong. Everything. Don't argue with her. I just said, um, Nancy and I were there. I said, um, did they ever change your diaper? Yeah. Okay. You're um, 17 years old now. Did they ever feed you? You wouldn't be here if they hadn't. Well, yeah, I guess they did. Okay, they didn't do everything wrong, right? But they may have done a lot of things. I was going to do that, but don't let your life be crucified by fear and regret. The last cross is Calvary, and that can keep us from wasting our time, from being pinned there on those empty crosses. It sets us free from them. So let's sum it all up here. What do you do with regrets? I invite you to let go of them, friends. There's a place for them. Take them to Jesus. Fears, what do you do with that? Take it to God. Confess them. Say, God, I'm afraid of this or that. You know what that feels like, Lord? You better believe he does. Lord, I've been rejected. You know what that feels like? He better believe he does. He turned to Isaiah chapter 51. He was despised and rejected of men. Good intentions aren't enough. They must be followed by good actions, right? That's pretty simple. Good intentions must be followed by what? Exactly. None of you can do this on your own. <clears throat> There's one ingredient that you and I need and that will keep us from being paralyzed and pinned on those false crosses, fear, regret, good intentions. That one ingredient is trust. I trust you. I trust you. I was I was going to do that. But the choice is yours, friends. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts for Jesus Christ this morning. We thank you for the love and mercy that we find there, Father. We acknowledge the regrets that we find when we look at ourselves. We acknowledge the fears, Father, when we look deep in our hearts. And so we turn to you this morning as the one who invites us to bring our fears to him. We hand them over to you, Lord. We don't want them anymore. And we hand our regrets over, Father. We acknowledge that we have muddied the waters at times. Hold those regrets in your hand. Take them from us.
We acknowledge that we have had good intentions in life that went unfulfilled, Lord. Help us to follow good intentions with good action, motivated by your word and strengthened by your Holy Spirit. I ask your blessing upon every person here in this room. I ask that you would speak peace and wisdom to the hearts of each individual. I ask that together, Father, we would know that there is a God who loves us and that people would find the truths that we hold winsome and they'd want to know more. And so as we kneel at the cross, Father, we thank you for taking away the three false crosses. In Jesus' name, amen. And now we have a song. <laughs>